Take time to listen to your breath. That doesn't mean listening to the sound of the breath. It means paying very careful attention to how the breath feels. And if you watch it carefully, you begin to get more sensitive to the fact that sometimes the breath is too long, too short. And you can learn how to read the signals. And you many times find that the body's need for breath changes. Sometimes very quickly. Sometimes a good long breath feels good for one or two breaths, and then it doesn't feel good anymore. And so you're free to change. And the more carefully you pay attention to the breath, the more you'll notice the signals. If you try to force it into a particular rhythm or keep it at a particular rhythm no matter what, it starts getting mechanical, it starts getting unpleasant, and the mind's going to go away. So try to figure out what kind of breathing feels best right now. And then watch it for a while to see if it really does stay on feeling best. And be willing to change. Be willing to learn from the breath. Remember, we're not here to force the mind into a particular mold, or to clone it or program it in a particular, particular fashion. We're here to explore, because that's the only way the Dharma is going to be discovered, is by exploring. And a lot of times exploring means just playing around. It's part of the one of the lessons that John Fung stressed again and again is play with the breath. Play with the meditation. He didn't mean play in a desultory way. But you might have the attitude that finds it fun to experiment, to learn new things, to learn some of the complexities of the breath. It's not just in and out. There are lots of ins and lots of outs to the breath. And if you come away from the breath just learning one or two lessons, that's good that you learn some lessons, but be willing to learn more each time you sit down and meditate. There's always something new to learn. Because if you just deal with your stereotypes about the breath, after a while you start stop seeing anything at all. The meditation gets boring, gets irritating. And you find it hard to stick with it. Right here you're learning some very important lessons about causality, which was the heart of the Buddha's awakening, as he described it. Many people have expressed their dissatisfaction with the accounts of the awakening. They'd like to hear all about those wonderful visions of oneness or interconnectedness. And yet the Buddha boils everything down to a causal pattern. Basically, at the present moment is made up of two, three things, actually. Results of past actions, your present actions, and the results of your present actions, all acting together. And because there's so much coming from the past, this can be very complex. And the complexity means that we can't just boil everything down to one or two simple little lessons and carry them around. We have to be open to observing and watching. This is what the training is, is learning how to be an observer, how to watch, how to experiment, and be 
be willing to keep on experimenting, keep on observing. Make that your mode of being, your mode of acting. One of the advantages of this is that many times you find yourself in a situation where you think there are only one or two alternatives to act. But if you learn how to experiment, you begin to realize there's lots more. You may have some habitual ways of acting or some habitual ways of relating to the present moment. Remember, that's part of the karma you bring in from the past. But you can always learn something new in the present moment. You can always try something new in the present moment. That's where your freedom is. You're not stuck in your old patterns. You don't have to be stuck in your old patterns. So how do you experiment? The Buddha's basic lesson to his son is kind of the, big, the foundation of his experimental method. You look at your intentions. And you ask yourself, is this going to lead to pleasure or to pain? Is it going to be harmful or not? If it looks like it's going to be harmful, you just don't do it. If it doesn't look like it's going to be harmful, then you follow through while you're acting. Sometimes some of the results of your actions show themselves immediately. So check to see if there's any harm that's coming up that you didn't expect. If there is, then you stop. If there's none, you keep on acting. When you're done, over the long term you look back and you reflect on the results of your actions. And again, if you see some harm that happened that you hadn't expected, just make up your mind you're not going to do that again. You're not going to act that way in that situation again. If there's no harm, then the Buddha says, take pleasure in being on the path. Take pleasure in your training. This is important. You have to learn how to give yourself nourishment along the way. Otherwise, this constant observing and constant evaluation can get pretty dry. And if you find harm from the actions that you did, well, you talk it over with someone else. That way you learn how to get some outside perspective. Because it's important in practice you learn how to step back from your normal ways of doing things. This is a lot of what the not-self teaching is all about. It's not simply not identifying with a particular thing, but it's not identifying with it necessarily with a particular way of doing things. All those five aggregates that we're supposed not to identify with, they're actually actions. Form is a type of activity. Feeling, perception, thought constructing, cognizing, these are all activities. They're ways of doing things. And so often we identify with the way we do something. There's an old Frank Sinatra song, My Way. When you really listen to the song, you see how dumb the person is. Made a lot of mistakes, but God damn it, I did it my way. Well, there's still mistakes, and they're still stupid. And they can still be avoided. That's the important thing. So sometimes this requires using your own ingenuity, sometimes it requires getting outside perspectives. So you can step back, look at what you're doing. And think of new ways of doing things, and you can notice that what you, the way you're doing things is not working out. But if you take this approach, one, you find it simplifies things a lot of ways. You don't have to be stuck in old ways. And you can focus on your intention as the important thing. And you learn how to be more sensitive to what's going on around you. This way you resolve that old dilemma. Do I listen to other people or do I listen to myself?
Again, those are two extremes. If you just listen to yourself, if you actually listen to yourself, what do you hear? You hear all kinds of voices. If you listen to other people, you hear all kinds of voices, often at odds with one another. So the way to sort things out is by seeing what seems most reasonable, what seems most harmless, and then putting it into practice and seeing what actually results. In other words, everything is to be tested. The things you hear from outside, the things that pop up in your mind, you test them. The stories of a John Munn meditating in the forest and getting visions, being visited by devas, all kinds of things. And most people, when those things happen in their meditation, just ride with them. But the reason he was able to come out and become a great teacher was that he tested everything. No matter who in his vision said what to do, he always tested it. Just one checked it against his sense of what seemed reasonable, what seemed harmless, and then tried it out to see if it actually worked. And that way he protected himself from going off on all sorts of tangents. and at the same time protected himself from the inevitable misunderstandings. We hear other people talk, we hear their messages, and we filter them out. We hear only certain things. So you test what you've heard. If you keep this up long enough, you find that you're less and less likely to be dealing with stereotypes, either about what the other people said or what they think or what they do. Stereotypes about other people, stereotypes about yourself. Those oversimplifications that can always get in the way. Again, this comes from the ability to keep on listening, keep on observing. That's one of the important principles in all the practices that some lessons you learn apply across the board. Other lessons you have to apply them only at the right time. Having a sense of time, a sense of place, this is an important aspect of wisdom and discernment. When to ride yourself hard, when to be easier on yourself, this is a lesson you have to learn. Over time. But it can be done by being observant, being sensitive to your own actions. If you know you have a particular tendency, watch out for it. A particular tendency that's unskillful, watch out for it. You realize that you don't have to identify with that. Sometimes we pick these tendencies up from other people. Sometimes they're part of our karma, but whatever. You're not bound to them all the time. So this is why we spend so much time watching the breath, because the breath has lots of different lessons. Some of them are lessons you learn across the board, others are lessons that are specific to specific situations. How to work with a breath, say, when you have a headache. How to work with a breath when you're sick. How to work with a breath when you're angry. When you're impatient. How can you use the breath to make yourself more patient? When you're lackadaisical, how to use the breath to wake yourself up. Even something as basic as the breath has these variations, has these lessons to offer. And when you get used to looking for these lessons with the breath, then you, you find yourself more willing to look to the lessons around you in other areas as well.
because otherwise we stay stuck in our same old ways of doing things and our same old ways of thinking things and seeing things. And it puts us in a rut. If we couldn't change our ways, the Buddha wouldn't have taught the Dharma. There wouldn't have been any purpose to it. But it's because we have that element of freedom with each moment. A thought comes into your head, it's usually largely something from past karma. And you have the choice whether to go with it or not. Right there lies your freedom. It's because of this principle that when you look at the Buddha's teachings, there are so many different ways that he taught different people. He wasn't like the type of teacher who had one, one method of meditation or one doctrine that applied to everything. He had an approach that was consistent, but it would come up with different lessons for specific people at specific times. That's because he liked to explore. That's why he was such a good teacher. And John Fuang often commented that when he was teaching, he'd get these students to come in with problems that were things that he had never heard of before. But he had this particular approach, the way of looking at the breath, the way of playing with the breath, working with the breath. The basic principles there, he said, you could apply. Look at those principles and you'll find an answer to just about every problem in meditation, he said. Which can be boiled down to being observant, using your ingenuity, being willing to play. And if there are mistakes, well, there are mistakes. You chalk them up to experience. When I first went to stay with him, that there's the whole issue of having respect. Raised in America, you're used to having lots of independence. And you go over there and you see all the hierarchy, and you say, my gosh, I've got to fit myself into the hierarchy. I've got to do as I'm told, and you, you run, you break for it. And so when I was staying with him, he noticed that I was having problems going back and forth, back and forth this way. He told me a story one time, one time when he was staying with the John Lee. They were building an ordination hall. And ordinarily in Thailand, in the ordination hall, the, the Buddha image is on the western side of the hall, facing east, because that was the direction the Buddha was facing on the day of his awakening. And so when they made the foundation for the hall, they put all the foundation stones under the, the western side of the building and placed all sorts of auspicious objects there with a plan that the Buddha image would be on top of that. Nobody would step over it. And then as the hall was nearing completion, John Lee changed his mind. He had the Buddha image put on the other side, on the eastern side, facing west. The people over there are still talking about what he had in mind. But anyway, there was a problem. All of a sudden they realized that all those auspicious objects were under part of the floor where people would be stepping all over it all the time, which in Thailand you don't do. So one evening he told John Fuang, he said, tomorrow I'll get all the monks and novices down there and move that thing. Put it onto the Buddha image. Well, John Fung knew you couldn't do that. Because under the hall there was just a lot of mud. And that foundation stone was very firmly placed. But, you know, if he said you couldn't do that, a John Lee would say, well, in that case, I'll find somebody else to do it. So the next day he took a John Fung took all the monks and novices who could do any work and got them under the Ordination Hall, 
down there in the mud and we put ropes around the thing and tried to pull it and just a whole day of pulling it didn't work. So that evening he went to see a John Lee and suggested, how about this? How about if we open up the old foundation stone, make a new foundation stone under where the Buddha image is now, open up the old one, take all the auspicious things out of that and put it in the new foundation stone and seal them up. John Lee was sitting there chewing his beetle nut, so he shook his head a little bit and said, yes. That, John Fuhrman said, was how you show respect. In other words, what the teacher says, you give it a try. But just because he said it doesn't mean that he can't change his mind or who won't learn from the fact if recommendation doesn't work out, there might be another way of doing it. In other words, both sides are experimenting. And it's this attitude, this approach. There's the respect, but there's the willingness to change. There's a the willingness to learn from conditions at all times. That's what's kept the Buddhist teaching alive. Each person being observant. Each person being willing to learn. Alive to the fact that things are complex, but they're complex in a way that you can learn how to deal with them. And how to discover the patterns under that complexity in such a way that you can finally work your way out of it, which is the whole point. So you get to something where there's, you don't have to play around anymore. You don't have to deal with uncertainties and complexities. At least as far as that's concerned. But once you see the solidity of the deathless, And it's a lot easier to play with the complexities that still remain in all the other aspects of your life. Knowing that nothing else can touch this.